from the clinics. There are several people, they want to come and they're in the clinic. So in the beginning, just my presentation, so they're not going to lose everything. The important talk is Dr. Hausdorff. Basically, I would like to thank uh, Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey Hausdorff coming from Israel to London to give those talk. This morning he gave the joint grand round between the Division of Theoretic Medicine and the Clinical Neuroscience Department at the University Hospital. We got the very good turnout, very nice questions about Parkinson's disease and other people. This uh, uh, noon, he interacted with our fellows and residents, and we did the critical appraise of two classic papers the team of Jeffrey House have published in the last five years about gait variability as a predictor of falls and also about treatments improving cognition to improve risk of falls and about also executive functions of predictor of falls. And I think it was a very fruitful interaction with the trainees and Dr. Hausner. And now we have our classic seminar in our fifth edition. And a few words about Dr. Jeffrey Hauser. He's, um, he, he's a very well-recognized scientist in the field of geriatric medicine and also bioengineering. He was one of the first to postulate that subtle changes in the gait, particularly gait variability, may be a predictor of future faults, fractures, <clears throat> and adverse events. Um, I recall like it was yesterday when in 1998, in the first part of my PhD, I visited him in Harvard with Louis Lipson, and he, he was very generous to mentor me in that moment in our research, so I, I, I found he very helpful in my career. I have eternal gratitude for that, Jeffrey. Um, since then, he has done a very well amount of publications. He has over 100 publications in PubMed, and he has received several awards, but for me, I think we have to, as clinicians and geriatricians, to highlight he got the Outstanding Achieving Award for the American Geriatric Society due to his contributions to the geriatric research and clinical geriatric research, which is very important. When you are recognized for those clinical geriatric societies, that means you may translate those fundings in clinical applications. Mm, from Harvard, he moved to Israel, and where now he's the chair and director of the <coughs> Gate uh, and Neurodynamics Laboratory. And he's doing a lot of research, not only in the observational gait assessment, but also in interventions. He's, he's a, one of the pioneers doing interventions to improve cognition, to improve mobility. Now he's already associate editor of the journal Gerontology and Medical Sciences, which is one of the journals with highest impact factor in clinical genetic medicine. So, Jeffrey, thank you very much for coming, and this is an applause for you. Right now. Thank you. My introduction is going to be just five slides, and half of the people already saw those slides before in other introductions I did, but basically, all the time I start with that quotation of, of Desmond Morris when he tried to describe in the human evolution how human beings may evolve for the ancient ape. And under the evolutionary hypothesis, and Desmond Morris tried to, 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 to expand that, he said that everything was against the ancient ape to evolve to the human being. But if some changes may happen that proto hominids at that moment, particularly if that moment that Asian ape was able to keep his body in an upright position, to move his hand in one way and their feet in another, to keep improving his brain and to use his mind as best as possible, perhaps he stood the chance of success. So it means everything was against to that Asian ape to be the predominant species for several reasons. But the key feature was that bipedalism to stand up and to feet and to release the hands was a key feature to have the encephalization process. Basically, we know that all the bipedalism means to walk most of the time in two feet. It took at least five million years in the human evolution. And that's a very well documented anthropological evidence. Interestingly, for a few years was a, a, an issue of contention about what were the pathways in the human evolution. First, the first hypothesis was what well, from the Asian primate, first they have to evolve the brain to be an intelligent primate, and being an intelligent primate may generate that the that primate may can have biped and evolve to human. Later on, it seems that the pathway was not in that way, that first bipedalism was a key feature to have the encephalization. 
So it's in bipedalism was a key, key, key event, as I told you before. In fact, we know that it happened a, mi a million years before the cephalization process. And it was a necessary step. There are several theories why it was a necessary step. An easy way to explain it well, when the Asian ape was able to stand up and lift the hands, they may create tools and change the diet. And the, this huge amount of proteins in the diet for hunting may help to develop the brain. That's one easy way to explain that. There's more complex issues that are beyond this talk today. But my, the key point I want to make that bipedal was a capital to the humans to be the primary species. And it took five million years, that evolutionary adaptation. Unfortunately, as, as the New Yorker tried to highlight in 2000, they know that bipedalism was very important in encephalization. They say, what is next? And for them, next was the epidemic of obesity, which is very prevalent right in the US. For us, we know what is next. Next is mobility decline and fall. So that achievement that took five million years in the human evolution, by pedaling to walk into feet, only in 70 or 80 years, a human being can lose very quickly with mobility decline, a slow gait velocity, fall and fractures. So there is like an involution in the single individual of that evolutionary step which was bipedalism. Um, there are several causes. We don't know who is the real cause, but we know there are risk factors for that. And from those risk factors, we know that cognition, particularly gait balance problems and depression and dementia, are very important. And one of the first geriatricians that established or posed the question about the role of cognition in falls and fractures was Bernard Isaac. And with this rhetorical question he published in 78 in Intonation, he wondered if falls were a manifestation of brain failure. Not just muscle or bone problems, but also manifestation of brain failure. So basically, I think Jeffrey is one of the researchers and scientists in the world that help us to untangle that relation between cognition, mobility, falls, which I think is very important. By the other hand, if we understand human being as a complex system, complex systems fall apart from the highest level of complexity. And our highest level of complexity is the brain and also walking, because we know gait as a task. It's very complex and a hardwired process, involving several systems beyond neuromuscular system. It's involving neurological system, cognition, cardiovascular system, lung system. So we know it's a very high complex activity. So, just to finish this quick introduction, I finished with a quotation of Bernard Isaacs, um, where he's talking about mobility, false fractures. He used this quote that said, it takes a child one year to acquire independent movement and 10 years to acquire independent mobility, the capacity to cross the street alone, for example. Unfortunately, an old person can lose both in one day after a fall. And I think Jeffrey is doing a cutting edge research to help us to cope with this problem. So Jeffrey, thank you very much again. I will do your presentation. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, taking time out of your afternoon. And thank you, Manuel, for, that, for the invitation to uh, be here and to, for that very kind introduction. And I think if anyone needs to take away a, the bottom line, if we don't make it to the, to the end of the session, uh, the answer to Dr. Isaac's question, uh, whether falls are a brain failure, I would like to suggest uh, is yes. So um, maybe we'll try and provide some evidence towards that. In, during the next uh, uh, hour or so. So um, I saw this uh, neat little icon. I think maybe you want to have it as your mascot for the Gate and Brain la Lab. Thank you. I think it very nice illustrates the concept we're talking about, uh, the relationship between uh, cognitive function and walking. And uh, just in terms of the outline for the talk, um, in the first part of the talk, I'm, it's basically, I think, to many of you, it's going to be a review. Um, there might not be that much new information, and maybe the context will be helpful. But basically, I want to describe and summarize very briefly a large growing uh, body of literature which suggests that, that there is a, 
um, you know, the, the relationship between higher level cognitive function, gait, and, and falls, you know, in particular in older adults and uh, certain patient, patient populations as well. Um, and in, uh, I feel a little bit like, uh, you know, like selling snow to the Eskimos because I think, you know, anyone familiar with Manuel's work and uh, work that's going on already is very familiar with this relationship. So hopefully I'll put a little bit of that in context and really set the stage for the second part of the talk where I'll suggest whether or not we can actually use that information not only to understand falls and to predict falls, but actually to reduce the risk of falls via interventions and, and cognitive therapy. So again, just not to belabor the point, but just put us all in the same context. Uh, as you all know, uh, falls in older adults are common. Uh, more than one-third of older adults f fall each year. They're costly. They're a major cause of, uh, uh, in the UK, for example, about 1% of the uh, healthcare budget is all spent just on falls. Uh, they're a significant cause of morbidity and mortality. They lead to nursing home admission, fear of falling, a whole long list of negative outcomes that are associated with falls, even when there is no hip fracture and even if there is no major event. So falls are a major uh, in some sense a catastrophic outcome that we want to try and avoid and prevent and reduce the, that risk. Certainly uh, uh, repeated falls and also to avoid the first fall to begin with. If we can do that, you know, we can avoid going down this uh, kind of slippery slope that we want to, there's no end to. You know, and we know when we talk about falls there's, uh, and snow, <laughs> sometimes it's very easy to understand why certain older adults fall. This, this penguin has a friend who is not very friendly and uh, sticks at their trip. <laughs> but uh, there's a whole group of older adults who we really don't understand. We call them idiopathic elderly fallers, and we don't really understand what's going on. They have a little of this, a little of that, but there's no obvious cause of falling. And I'm kind of concentrating on that group uh, in, in particular today. But I'd like to start out with raising some questions. Maybe the answers are already obvious to some of you who are working in the field, but just to get us thinking a little bit about. When we talk about falls, we know that, I mentioned that falls occur in about one third of community living older adults. In patients with Alzheimer's disease, they fall, let me just ask the audience, we'll poll the audience, you, got, you guys have the 60, what's the question, uh, 64 million dollar question, or whatever, anyway, this is a game, um, you can poll, well you can poll the audience, right, who falls more, patients with Parkinson's disease or patients with Alzheimer's disease? What percent, you know, which percent of, uh, if, if we said one third of uh, community living older adults fall, patients with Alzheimer's disease are closer to patients with Parkinson's disease in terms of their percent of falls each year or com closer to the community living older adults? Or they don't fall at all, maybe. Come on, somebody. Closer to Parkinson's disease or closer to community living older adults? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, yeah. We're, how much do they, do they fall a lot or fall a little? What's that? More. More, right. In fact, they, according to some studies, the Buckner and, uh, and other studies, they fall as much as patients with Parkinson's disease. So if patients with Parkinson's disease, at least with disease progression, they can fall, 80% of them experience falls, repeated falls during the year. And there are a number of studies that show with patients with Alzheimer's disease fall just as much as patients with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is uh, easy to understand. It's a motor disease problem. We understand why, it, uh, it, it's, you know, putatively a motor disease problem. We can understand why they fall. Alzheimer's disease, it's a problem with memory, you would say, at least uh, at first glance, problem with the hippocampus. A little bit hard to understand why these patients are, are falling if uh, falling is a motor problem, Alzheimer's is a problem with memory. Um, and in addition, you know, we have in the geriatric uh, bag of arms, we have this multi, what's you know, already traditional multifactorial intervention, works on balance, strength training, et cetera, uh, and does a nice job of reducing fall risk in community moving older adults by a certain degree. In Alzheimer's disease, it's not effective. And, uh, you know, to start off, if Alzheimer's disease is if they're falling for the same reason that everyone else is falling, the question is why is, is that not effective? Another thing about dementia we know is this, for, uh, for example, from this work by Joe Vergesi and all from the Einstein Aging Study in New York, um, is that uh, gait changes, certain types of gait changes can actually predict the development of dementia. So here uh, you, you can see the number of the percentage of subjects who were survived without dementia on the y-axis. Um, subjects, these are again older adults in the Einstein aging cohort, um, and you can see those with normal gait at baseline who were then followed, 80% of them did not develop dementia over time. 
So most of them who had normal gait at baseline, only a few, only 20% developed d dementia, in this case vascular dementia. Uh, in contrast, those who had abnormal gait at baseline, 85 of them, only only eight, um, let's say it this way, only 20% did not develop dementia. So 80% of those who had normal gait at baseline, 80% of them developed dementia, just exactly the flip, flip of those who had normal gait. And again, it, this kind of begs the question, what's, why is there this such a predictive value between gait or certain types of gait and dementia? Again, if dementia is a cognitive problem, gait is a motor problem, it's a little bit uh, hard to understand what's going on here. So just to summarize those three questions, which we'll come back to, and maybe the answer is already clear to all of you. You've been converted already, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, so one question is why are falls so common in Alzheimer's disease? Why does the traditional uh, multifactorial intervention that's used in geriatric medicine so effectively, why is it ineffective in, in Alzheimer's disease? And why do gait changes predict dementia? So to answer that question, we'll put forth another question, and that's, what is dual tasking? So, uh, dual tasking, you know, is the simultaneous performance of two tasks. It's a com common paradigm for studying the attentional demand of a, of a cognitive of a, of a given task. Um, here you see an example of someone uh, eating, drinking. I'm not sure if she's driving or watching a movie. Uh, uh, it's maybe not recommended at home. But presumably she's doing all the tasks quite well without impairing. Uh, anything that's going on. And basically the idea of dual task is that if the tasks that are performed are automatic or if they don't require any attention, then I can do multiple tasks and it won't impact one or the other. I can walk and chew gum, presumably, and the chewing gum won't affect my gait. Um, and you know, there are def a lot of different theories to try and understand what dual tasking is and how it, how it works. Um, really the simplest theory although I'm not necessarily explaining all the studies, is something that's been re referred to as the capacity sh sharing theory. That basically says that uh, there's limited information processing capacity in a, in a person's brain, cortical resources. And if I perform two tasks that demand attention, task A and task B, and they both compete for attention, then at a certain point, if the tasks are difficult or challenging enough, or are competing for cognitive resources, then the performance of one will impact on the other. Conversely, if task A is an automated, automated task and doesn't rely on attention, doesn't utilize cognitive resources, I can uh, do task A, task B, task C that are automated, they're all automatic and not relying on attention and it won't affect my task B, some other task that might relate and might be dependent on, on uh, attention. So a number of researchers have used this dual task paradigm to understand whether or not gate is uh, relies on, on cognitive function and attention in particular. So again, a priori you would s might hypothesize that if gait is automatic, uh, could do many different attention tasks and it would have no effect. So if we think about gait and what we learned in, in textbooks about walking, uh, you could suggest that gait is an automatic process. You know, the, the central pattern generators, uh, which are, there's good evidence for central pattern generators in animals and some evidence as well in, uh, in, in humans and based on spinal cord studies and others. We know that infants are able to generate locomotor pattern. If you hold them up and give them support, they can uh, move their legs in a, in, a, in a mimicking walking. Adults, from our everyday experience, can walk, talk, chew gum. Uh, apparently no impact on our gait. And also, you know, many studies of disseverate cats are able to walk and apparently without cortical function, without heads. Um, and again, from our everyday experience, we know we can walk on our cell phone, talk to our friend, uh, navigate uh, complex terrains while carrying objects, uh, <laughs> presumably without any major impact on our ability to, to walk and our, our gait function. You know, here's an example of the man of the year, the Budweiser man of the year from a few years ago. He's carrying his Budweiser, looks, his gait looks perfectly normal. His uh, girlfriend is carrying the Budweiser. Maybe there's a little bit of impact on her gait due to the uh, weight of the uh, package there, but it uh, looks like his gait is pretty normal. And indeed, there's a fascinating story if you want to go Google searching afterwards about Mike, the headless chicken. Uh, Mike was, uh, somebody's son-in-law was preparing dinner for his mother-in-law who was visiting from out of town and uh, he didn't quite prepare the chicken just right and instead of totally decapitating the chicken, uh, he cut it in just some way that Mike, the wonder chicken, uh, walked afterwards for 18 months without a head. 
who was fed by droplets uh, and uh, wasn't served for supper, but uh, made it to Google's uh, uh, search engine. And uh, you know, presumably, that when Mike, Mike the Headless Chicken was brought into the gate analysis lab, his gait was perfectly normal. So, <laughs> more evidence that gait does not require cortical input. Um, you know, but more seriously, if you look at any of the classic texts on, on gait, uh, this is a, a text by uh, Tom McMahon uh, from Harvard. Uh, the title or it gives away the answer, you know, muscles, reflexes, and locomotion, that's what walking is. If you search in the index or look flip through the pages, there's higher level cognitive function, cortical function, executive function, attention are nowhere to be found in any of those textbooks. If you look at uh, Jacqueline Perry's classic Bible on gait, gait analysis, it's a 500 page tome uh, that requires require several people to carry. Uh, there is no mention of cognitive function, attention, executive function in that, in that work. Um, Presumably they knew what they were talking about, and presumably that, that is the view, the extent, was the extent view of how we understood gait and normal walking 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, that view has changed, and I think, well, a priori you can argue, you know, why might dual tasking affect gait? Um, a priori, if you understand gait as an automatic process related to CPGs and there's really not too many good reasons to argue that uh, dual tasking should affect the gait. You could say it is indeed automatic, auto automated, and should be able to walk and talk like the gentleman on the cell phone and shouldn't affect my gait. And you could say uh, the a priori arguments are hard to find. But maybe if we're the clinicians in the audience, those who treat uh, older adults who fall, they might have told you that they started to walk across the street either, and uh, someone turned to them and started to talk to them. They fell out and they felt distracted, found themselves on the floor, or their cell phone went off, found themselves on the floor, or my father-in-law told me he was walking down some stairs the other day and then decided to text somebody and found himself on the floor. There's lots of anecdotal evidence that, uh, at least in older adults, um, uh, gait actually does require uh, cognitive function and attention. Um, so let's look at, take a look at some of the literature that. Um, there are probably literally hundreds of studies that have looked at the effects of uh, dual tasking on, on balance and gait. We'll just take a quick preview, a quick look at a few of those. I think one of the classic studies that really got the field moving was a study that was pr uh, published in Lancet more than, uh, more than 10 years ago by London Olson and colleagues. It's a very interesting, very uh, simple study in some sense. It was, there was no high technology, no fancy cameras, no LEDs, no, sorry to say, no gate mats involved here as well. Uh, but a very interesting study. The research assistant uh, walked with, uh, these were, uh, I believe, nursing home residents, and the research assistant uh, started to walk with the subjects down the hall and started to talk to them. And they found that a number of subjects were not able to walk and talk at the same time. And they classified those as the uh, stops walking when talking, 12 of them had to stop walking when they were talking, and the 46 of subjects were able to walk and talk at the same time. And then they followed these subjects for six months, you know, using diaries, the classic way of uh, assessing fall risk and falls over time. And they found that those uh, older adults who were able to walk and talk, 80% of them did not fall over time. So only 20%, less than 20%, fell over the six-month follow-up period, as opposed to those who stopped walking while talking, they could not walk and perform a simple task of talking at the same time, only 20% of them did not fall. So 80% of those who stopped walking when talking uh, fell over the course of time. A huge gap between these two groups. Um, relative, you know, pretty nice evidence suggesting that uh, walking requires attention, at least in this population. If you look more closely at the fine details, there's um, It'd be a, it's a good paper to have a, maybe a seminar or a, to bring to your uh, geriatric trainees to discuss the uh, pros and cons of this paper. But it, I think it really got the literature moving and people thinking about stops walking while talking and, and gait as requiring attention or, or not. Um, a few of our studies that looked at this question, uh, we've focused on a measure that we call gait variability. Gait variability is a uh, is in some sense 
a reflection of the automaticity of gait pattern. You know, if I'm late for an appointment and I'm running to the bus, I might speed up, or if I'm early, I might slow down. But I, and that's uh, modulated in a large part by my my conscious uh, uh, will. Um, but typically, I don't say, "Well, I'm late for an appointment. I think I'll have to adjust my gait variability now." That's that's something that is more uh, automated. One one would argue, or one would. Uh, hypothetically, and something that's uh, subconsciously and sub uh, perhaps uh, under control. So we've asked subjects to perform various uh, dual tasks, for example, uh, subtracting serial sevens. Um, and another reason that we've been looking at gate variability is that we, we and others have shown uh, that gate variability is related to fall risk. So here you see the stride time or the gate period as a function of time. It's six minute, over six minutes in an older adult who with, uh, had no history of falls, uh, same measure of stride time as a function of time, six, over six minutes in an older adult with uh, risk of falls. And you can measure, you can see by eye that the, the mean or the average value is about 1.05 seconds here, same value about here. But what's different between the faller and the non-faller is the variability. The fallers are unable to walk with a consistent pattern. Their gait is uh, arrhythmic and unsteady. Um, and you know, we can quantify that in various different ways by, for example, the standard deviation or the coefficient of variation. You see that's two to three times larger in the fuller versus non fuller So not only is gait variability a measure that might be more automated than gait speed, but you can see from this example that it might be related to falls. And you can think, just to give you some idea, you know, to put in your head, you might think about the drunken sailor who has one too many beers uh, after uh, returning from sh uh, shore. And uh, every state is quite very unsteady. He's not able to walk in a, in a keep, can't keep a straight line. And every, every step is a challenge to him. They can't keep, their gait variability is all over the place. And if you give him a little bit of a nudge, he'll find himself on the floor. The same thing you could suggest is happening in these older adults. And that's the relationship between gait variability and fall risk. Uh, the walking pattern is unsteady. Every step is a, is a challenge. And they're not able to mean that uh, constant and consistent gait pattern. And therefore, if you add onto this something else, you might trigger the fall. And indeed, work by us and others, Joe Verjaisi and, and others, have shown that gait variability is not only uh, different in fallers and non-fallers retrospectively, but also it predicts falls. Uh, here, here's an example of a study that we showed that fallers' uh, gait variability was in a subjects who came to a geriatric clinic and they were prospectively followed for a year afterwards to see who fell and who did not experience falls. We found that the fallers had their variability at baseline was twice as large as the, as the non-fallers and there was a five-fold increase with a one standard deviation change in variability with a five-fold increase of fall risk over time. So uh, again, this is something that's been replicated by others and just showing that again the give variability is related to fall risk in older adults. So again, to return to our question, uh, does dual tasking affect gait variability during walking? Um, again, you might say that gait variability is, is automated, automatic, and might have no effect, or you, you can see other, might see otherwise. So here's an example of the effect in patients with Alzheimer's, in a patient with Alzheimer's disease. Here you see usual walking, again, the stride time is a function of time over 200 strides. There are these uh, small stride to stride fluctuations. Uh, indicative of, of some measure of gait in instability and gait variability. And then when they're asked to walk and perform, in this case, a relatively simple dual task, you can see that the stride to stride fluctuations are much larger, just visually much larger in doing dual tasking compared to single, single tasking. And that was true for a group of patients with Alzheimer's disease. If I were going to put age match controls for their stride time variability, I'd probably put it around here, about 50 milliseconds. Uh, during usual walking, Patients with Parkinson's disease already walk with increased variability compared to age match controls. Um, and during dual tasking, their variability increases by about 50 percent. So they're unable to walk. Uh, they're unable to walk with the consistent gait pattern at baseline. And then when they're asked to walk and do something else at the same time, their variability increases almost you know, again by almost 50 percent. And again, hopefully you're thinking, well, maybe this partially explains why Alzheimer's disease patients fall. Because uh, again, if we view this as a risk mark or a risk factor in fall risk, we can understand that when patients with Alzheimer's walk and do other tasks at the same time, they're in some sense increasing the risk of falls. Uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease, again, which 
a priori you might say is a motor disease or a purely motor disease, but we know that's really not the case anymore. Here's the example of the effects of dual tasking in patients with Parkinson's disease during usual walking and then when they're asked to walk and perform a, another task at the same time. Um, again, their coefficient of variation more than doubles in this example. And here's just a, you, you might be saying, well, everybody, if they walk and talk and do other tasks at the same time, uh, everybody increases their variability. Actually, that's not the case. Here's an example of an age match control during usual walking and then when they ask to perform serial seven subtractions. And you can see that uh, visually, again, there's no effect on their, their stride variability. Their gait pattern looks almost identical when an older adult is asked to, a healthy older adult is asked to walk and perform t another task, as opposed to the patient with Parkinson's disease. Look, they, walk, they start out with usual walking, their variability is twice that of this example patient, and then when they're asked to walk and perform another task, again, that variability increases further, again, suggesting perhaps that fall risk is increasing in these patients with Parkinson's disease as they walk and perform multiple tasks. Uh, in so-called idiopathic elderly fallers, these are older adults who fall for no apparent reason. We find similar results. You can see uh, um, in three different, three different dual tasks, as we increase the, the level of difficulty or the cognitive challenge, the variability, the level of stride-stride variability increases, and again, no effect on age match controls. Uh, the level of the variability is constant, despite uh, even in the presence of relatively difficult uh, cognitive loading. And we've asked uh, in several studies, you know, which factors might predict uh, or explain the increase in dual in, in gait variability during dual tasking. Is it age? Is it disease severity? And whether in an Alzheimer's disease or a patient with Parkinson's disease, memory, executive function, or all of the above. In our first study in Parkinson's disease, we didn't really me measure a lot of these things very well. We used some crude measures, and the, the answer that we got was nothing explained it. We were a little surprised and a little disappointed. In other studies, though, we found very consistently, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, that the one measure that explained the increased uh, variability during dual tasking was executive function. And that, we've, uh, that executive function measures were, uh, were associated with the increased dual tasking variability in patients with Alzheimer's disease. In idiopathic, so-called idiopathic elderly fallers, we measured their many mental, uh, well, uh, their MMSE scores, and we found the fallers and non-fallers had uh, identical MMSE scores, you know, a mean about 29, near perfect scores, suggesting based on the MMSE that cognitive function is not playing any role in fall risk. But when we looked more closely and gave uh, subjects a computerized neuropsych exam that had uh, different domains, including memory, visual spatial function, executive function, and attention, we found uh, in, on this index higher scores are, are better. Uh, lower scores, actually scores below 100 indicate uh, some form of uh, cognitive deficit or, or impairment. We found that the fallers uh, had a significantly, significant reduction in both executive function and attention compared to non-fallers. Again, these are subjects, remember, we had many mental scores of uh, 29 near perfect. And we found that when we looked at the relationship between executive function and cognitive function, or exec excuse me, executive function and dual tasking gave variability, during usual walking we found a moderate suggestion, a small hint that there's a, a relationship between executive function and, dual t and gait variability. When we asked them to perform an easy dual task, that association became tighter and became significant. And then we asked them to uh, the, looked at the association between executive function and engaged variability during a more difficult task. We found that association became tighter uh, still, suggesting that as subjects are asked to perform more difficult tasks, there's a greater, greater reliance on executive function and attention. And in Parkinson's disease, we found almost identical results. Uh, we looked at, used the same neuropsych battery. Memory was similar. Uh, in, in patients with Parkinson's disease and controls. Um, however, executive function and attention uh, were significantly impaired in the patient with Parkinson's disease compared to controls. And again, just like very similar to what we saw among the, the idiopathic fallers, we found these associations between uh, gait variability and executive function in patients with Parkinson's disease that became tighter or um, increased during dual tasking and further increased uh, during the more difficult dual tasks, suggesting, again, increased reliance on executive function. 
So one way to understand what, the, what we, we and others have seen, the many, many other studies in the literature that have looked at the effects of dual tasking on gait and balance, is that w with aging and disease, there's in, uh, disturbed internal cueing. Gait becomes less automated or less automatic. And therefore, to generate a normal gait pattern, there's increased reliance on attentional resources. In other words, patients or older adults are using, they're compensating for, for perhaps subtle age-associated decline in, in gait and mobility by using cognitive function, cognitive resources, and attention. They're focusing their attention on their gait to improve their gait. Uh, and then what happens is, if they're asked then to perform another task, uh, there's increased sensitivity to dual tasking because there's competition for those attention and those cognitive resources. Since they're already compensating for attention, if they ask them to perform another task, there's now a conflict between, and there's a need to split their attention, and there's, uh, you'll see an effect of the dual task on their gait. And what happens though, not only as a comp is cognitive function being used for normal gait, but this is kind of a double whammy in, in aging populations and patients with Parkinson's disease, and even in Alzheimer's disease, we have these changes in gait, changes, and at the same time these changes in, in executive function. So we're asking subjects, or subjects are trying to compensate and improve their gait uh, using cognitive resources, but their cognitive resources are already impaired, their executive function is already impaired. So it's, in general, we have an increased sensitivity to dual tasking. And if, you know, if that might exceed a certain threshold, you can understand perhaps while a fall might occur. If, if, if we go above a certain, if there's a limited cognitive resources and uh, uh, increasing the demand for attentional resources. And here's an example of a patient with Parkinson's disease walking around these uh, cones, you know, imitating to some degree uh, functional walking or some kind of uh, challenging walking. And now on the right, you can see she's asked to walk and perform a dual task at the same time. <coughs> and uh, the researcher thankfully catches her. But you can see basically she starts to walk. She has a start hesitation. And at some point, she loses uh, her ability to walk and, and perform the dual task at the same time. And she actually loses her balance, starts to fall, as we suggested might happen in the case of uh, subjects who walk and rely on attention. <clears throat> Other evidence for uh, you know, the association between uh, gait and cognitive function is from a study that we did a few years ago where we asked older adults, we had them uh, play computer games, basically. We asked them to tap on a mouse, a relatively simple motor task, and we asked them to catch uh, balls, uh, not balls in the outfield, but balls on a computer screen. So it requires the same motor function as tapping, just using a mouse, but it requires uh, planning, navigation, and higher level cognitive resources. Um, so here's kind of the paradigm, comparing tapping versus catching. And we also had them on a separate occasion, not in front of the computer, we asked them to walk and measure their gait variability. And we found that gait variability uh, was very similar to catching, catching uh, again on the computer screen, in terms of uh, significant correlation between uh, catching and there was no association between tapping. So again, suggesting that walking in older adults is a complex task involving executive function. And indeed, when we, when we carried out uh, did neuropsych exams of executive function and Stroop tests, et cetera, we found that a gait was significantly associated with executive function and tapping, not surprisingly, was not. Just another example, maybe visually, to illustrate some of the things that we're talking about. Here's an example. Uh, we can ask the clinicians in the room what this uh, subject has. Can anybody tell from the way he's sitting what he has? Come on. It's, what does he have? No, OK. Uh, NPH is an excellent guess. Keep that in mind for. So we got MPH and uh, cerebellar ataxia, two reasonable guests. Anybody for Parkinson's disease? No, he doesn't have, that's not Parkinson's disease. Well, fear falling. Fear falling. You read the manuscript, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just watch the video a little, a little more. Here he is walking with his wife. Does he have NPH? 
cerebral ataxia? No. Fear of falling? Yes. <laughs> just fear of falling? So it's all in his head. It's just uh, some higher level, uh, maybe. But uh, now watch one more clip. Wow. Yeah, no one was harmed in the making of that video. So it just, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure what he has exactly. It's not MPH. His vision's okay. What's that? His vision's alright. His vision's okay. Yeah, but it, clearly he walked. He, you know, in terms of muscle strength and, uh, uh, you know, when he walks with his wife, you would say that he has no uh, balance or, or gait problems, and yet when he walks by himself and turns, you obviously there's something going on there. Just a, another, you know, you call it an atypical typical example. We study these patients and we call them higher level gait disorders basically because we don't know what else it is. But uh, suggesting some higher level cognitive function um, and maybe exaggerated fear of falling is playing a role. Can you test them on a Rombo test or single foot stand? Can you do any of that at all? Yeah, they can. Quite entirely normally? I don't know, normally, but not, not enough to explain what we see. Just a comment for the trainees. Typically, in fear of falling, a cautious gait, the patient is in that way, but I see you with an assistant, like someone walking with them, they walk normally. So in our clinical practice, when we have those people hesitating walking, we walk on the side, having the hand, and when they walk normally, they say, that's fear of falling, and we have the scales, like the ABC scale, or the FES scale for fear of falling. That is typical. Yeah, typical, typical, this patient, but it's typical. Yeah. They walk very well when you're on the side. And just uh, another um, additional evidence, you know, on the association between executive function and falls is from a study that uh, we published a couple of years ago. Uh, this was a pro prospective study in uh, about 250 community living older adults. We measured their gait, balance, cognitive function at baseline, and then followed them for uh, for two years initially. Um, and again, these were all healthy, didn't have stroke, Parkinson's disease, uh, other things that might explain uh, any falls. And you can see here the results of their uh, neuropsych testing at baseline before they were followed. And you can see the executive function was, had a, those subjects who had a, uh, relatively low scores on executive function as a significantly higher risk of falling over time compared to those who had normal executive function. And in contrast, if we you know, think about memory, at least uh, relatively long-term memory had no uh, impact. It was not associated with, with falls over time. So again, executive function predicting falls in a cohort of community living older adults. And you can see here the survival curves of the percent of subjects who did not fall, so nobody fell at baseline. Actually, we looked at a, a subset of subjects who had no history of falls. So these are kind of what we call naive fallers, first-time fallers, uh, based on self-report. And you can see that those who subjects who had better executive function were more likely to remain non-fallers compared to those subjects who had worse executive function at baseline over time. And similarly, if we looked at uh, those, um, not at executive function, but a, a proxy or another measure, dual tasking gait variability, so the ability to walk and keep gait variability at a low level, we see very similarly that subjects who had good gait variability during dual tasking, in other words, they were able to walk and can and keep their gait pattern uh, in a consistent way, they had a relatively low uh, fall risk. They were about 80% of them, again, did not fall during the follow-up period. Again, subjects who had high dual test gait variability, uh, most of them, were about 50% of them were uh, experienced falls during the follow-up. And uh, we recently looked at, uh, followed this cohort out for two more years, and you can see that that pattern uh, that w we saw after two years can, uh, persisted. So subjects, again, who had a good executive function at baseline continued, most of them did not fall, and subjects who had a relatively poor executive function at baseline uh, were much, much more likely to fall. Again, you know, as much as five years later, you still see a gap based on, merely on executive function. And again, these are community living older adults at baseline, many mental scores, scores all close to 30, healthy, independent, and again, just suggesting that executive function play a role in, in falls. Uh, have you uh, taken a population and dichotomized it, or uh, have you actually a priori defined what is high executive function and what is low executive function and classified people in that way? This is, we took the, pop we did the, the former. So, so but the actually, dichotomized I, population. this is a dichotomized, actually I can, uh, I should have, but I have another maybe a little bit of a prettier or more convincing plot that shows the, so this is the high, this is the 
subjects in the, low, in the best quartile and the lowest quartile, but the other two fit full in very nicely right in the middle. So uh, the, those, you know, if we look at the other two quartiles, they, two quartiles, they fall very nicely in the middle, suggesting you know, there really is a, not only an association at the extremes, but a kind of this, uh, I don't know, if linear relationship, but though the better executive function is associated with a reduced uh, fall risk. We just come on this paper in the critical appraisal with the fellows this, uh, this afternoon, and those with higher executive function, for example, in the entire making this B, the mean second was about 58 seconds. And those in the lower executive function, the inventorial training D was 240 seconds. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, it, the nice thing about this paper, the dividing quartet, but also make clinical sense in our clinical practice, because we know that trial takes make B over 180 is, is abnormal, it's not abnormal. So it makes make sense also in the clinical practice. But did any of these patients have falls before they entered the study? In the uh, this is a mixed. Group. This now makes on a mixed group, but in the study, uh, in this analysis, we excluded anyone who fell previously, at least based on self-report. So this is our. These are all, you know, first-time fallers, older adults. They're, they're first time to fall because, you know, as a, another uh, geriatrician, you know that the easiest way to predict falls is just to ask them, "Have you fallen in the past?" People who fall, unfortunately, we don't have any great answers to falling in. People who fall typically fall in the future. So, uh, so we looked at you know we were curious to, curious to see if we could challenge ourselves and challenge our ability to predict. Is look examine the you know before the first fall when it's maybe easier to intervene and more uh, prone to participate and you know if we could if we could reduce the likelihood of that first fall. So that this is again uh, the, that subset of subjects who reported no falls in, in previously. Do these groups differ in their educational level or their underlying? No, no. Uh, education, no. We had some measures of uh, pre-morbid or co you know intelligence levels, and that also seems to be uh, uh, did not differ. And, and no differences in vascular risk factors between the groups. Um, we didn't have great measures of vascular risk factors, but we didn't find anything. Other studies have shown you know there are there is a fairly large. Literature suggesting you know the importance of vascular risk factors and and falls and uh, and gait, uh, but in this cohort we didn't that didn't pop out maybe because they were too healthy or not clear why. These were elderly. Were, were they above a certain age? Yeah, they were. The mean, the minimum age was seventy. The mean I think was about seventy six uh, at baseline, and you know it was seventy to ninety was the was the range. Okay, so. Uh, hopefully you're all, you know, converted, and you understand that, you know, there is this relationship between gait, cognitive function, and falls. Um, hopefully you might already be thinking that it's not just associations that may be actually some causes of cause and effect. That maybe cognitive decline is maybe it's not causing f gait changes, but it's exacerbating changes by reducing the ability of older adults to compensate, for example. And uh, you know, so cognitive changes are. So there's this triangle, um, you know, and lots of associations based on dual task studies, prospective studies, and other studies showing these associations. But what I'd like to do now, we're, we're at the second part, so hopefully some of this will be new or newer to others, uh, is kind of flip this on its head and say, okay, we know that cognitive deficits increase the risk of falls, they impact on gait. What happens now if we intervene? Here's my one animation for the... <laughs> What happens if we intervene and try and improve cognitive function? What does that do to gait and what does that do to a fall, fall risk? If cognitive function is, is in the uh, uh, causal pathway, we would, we would suggest that improving cognitive function has a positive impact on gait and has a positive impact on fall risk and actually reduces fall risk. So that's the question I'd like to discuss with you uh, in the time that remains. Um, and uh, hopefully convince you that uh, indeed the we, one way to intervene, one way to Reduce fall risk is by improving gait and uh, is by Im uh, impacting and imp improving cognitive function. When we think about cognitive function, there's lots of studies in the literature and older adults about not necessarily related to to gait and fall risk, but th we can think uh, about different types of interventions: uh, pharmacologic interventions, physical training, behavioral, uh, and cognitive training. And I'll show you some evidence from each of the, those different domains. In terms of pharmacologic evidence, you know, again, geriatricians. 
are trained that uh, polypharmacy is bad, and I'm not going to argue with that statement. I, th I agree that you know, adding un unnecessary medications are probably have negative outcomes. There are lots of large meta-analyses suggesting that, and many studies showing that increasing, you know, the more medications a person has is typically associated with actually an increased falls. And so polypharmacy has a, you know, important, and study of polypharmacy has an important place in reducing fall risk. On the other hand, what I would like to suggest is there actually are some medications that may be useful for reducing, if they're used properly, some medications can be used to reduce the risk of falls, and not all medications are, are equal in their, on their impact on fall risk. And uh, the host for, the, for this evening, for this afternoon, Manuel already uh, postulated in uh, an article in 2009 that, for example, cholinesterase inhibitors may impact on gait and fall risk at a number of different levels, cortical level, subcortical, or spinal. Um, and this interesting sp speculation gave, uh, was received a very nice boost by a very nice study by Nick Bonin and colleagues out of University of Pittsburgh, where they uh, performed an imaging study in patients with Parkinson's disease as well as control uh, subjects, and they me measured uh, cholinergic activity in cortical, thalamic, and putamen, and they found that in all regions, uh, cholinergic activity was significantly reduced in patients with Parkinson's disease who were uh, fallers as opposed to the, the non-fallers. And that was, and you know, out here is a control group who the cholinergic activity was, was increased further. But what they show very nicely that cholinergic activity reduced, is reduced in patients, or at least in part, patients with Parkinson's disease who fall compared to Parkinson's disease patients do not fall. And at the same time, they showed there was no significant difference in niagara striatal dopaminergic activity among the fallers compared to the non-fallers. So suggesting, at least in patients with Parkinson's disease, that cholinesterase inhibitors and activity is related to fall risk. And uh, a very nice uh, study on related to this, you could say in some sense a follow-up study, was published by Chung et al. out of Oregon last year in neurology. They gave uh, subjects, patient, again, patients with Parkinson's disease, all of them who fell frequently at baseline. Um, a small study, only 19 subjects, but a uh, very interesting study. The subjects were re received Dinepazil. This is the cholinesterase inhibitor of choice for, for you know, often used in mild, uh, to treat mild dementia, for cognitive, and cognitive impairment in mild dementia. So subjects received 10 milligrams per day of Dinepazil for six weeks or a placebo, and they were crossed in a randomized double-blinded double fashion. On, the, on placebo, the fall rates were 0.25 per day. In other words, one fall every four days, pretty high fall risk, high number of falls. On the nepazil, that was reduced by 50% to 0.13 falls per day on average. Very uh, dramatic reduction, suggesting you know, a cholinesterase inhibitor reduces fall risk in at least in patients with Parkinson's disease. I think it's very, uh, you know, on the surface of it, it's very, it says, wow, we should give everybody denepazole and see what happens. But if you look more closely, actually, there looks to be two subgroups. You can see on placebo, there's a, a group who started out with very high fall rates and seemed to respond very, very nicely. And then there's another group who uh, perhaps are responding, but not to that same degree. So on the surface, you know, on the group averages, very nice, very dramatic, but if Need to be taken with a grain of salt. Nonetheless, you know, was published in neurology, a very high impact and well respected journal. It's, you know, I think it's very provocative and suggested that there might be at least a subgroup of, of fallers who denepazil and related medications might be useful. Another study out of, uh, led by Manu Manuel, uh, a small uh, study in patients with Alzheimer's disease who were given uh, denepazil. Uh, and then followed over time, one month and uh, four months later, you can see their usual walking gait speed and their gait speed during dual tasking improved in response to the nepazil and uh, some nice significant improvements in response to the nepazil as opposed to a kind of a, a control group, and these were patients with MCI who were followed over time and there was no improvement. So again, suggesting that not only in, in Parkinson's disease but also in Alzheimer's disease, the nepazil improves uh, gait and Again, if we say dual tasking abilities are related to fall risk, we can say suggest uh, that this might also reduce their fall risk. A uh, study by Olivier Boucher out of France 
doing, using a different type of uh, cholinesterase inhibitor, galantamine, uh, over 24 weeks. And again, in patients with Alzheimer's disease, you can see here before treatment that when they were asked to walk and perform a dual test, there was a significant increase in the stride time. Basically, you could suggest that they walked more slowly or their stride average was, was much was impacted by this dual tasking. And then after the receiving galantamine for 24 weeks, that impact of the dual task was, was now only marginal. And the, in some sense, you could uh, say that the dual tasking no longer had a significant impact on your, uh, on, on your gait. So in response to galantamine, they were able to walk better even in the presence of uh, dual tasking. Another study that, that looked at galantamine this time for, for six months, again, in, now back in patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, 21 subjects received galantamine for up to 60 milligrams per day for 24 weeks, uh, compared to uh, subjects in, in a control group. And galantamine, not so surprisingly, improved the uh, MSC, ADIS COG scores, clock joint scores, uh, frontal assessment battery. These are tests specific, specifically related to executive function. But what was uh, more surprising is that the uh, gait also improved in response to galantamine, and even the report that falls were significantly reduced in, in response to galantamine compared to the control group. Again, evidence linking cognitive function, if we view a galantamine and cholinase inhibitors as a impacting a cognitive function, see so how cogn cognitive function improves and gait and falls are uh, positively impact as well. We've looked at a, a different type of class of drugs, methylphenidate. Um, this was kind of been motivated by, you know, we know that in children with ADHD, giving them Ritalin improves their attention. And, um, but we asked, and we asked whether or not uh, if attention, if gait relies on attention, what happens if you give Ritalin to improve their attention and what, how that might impact gait. The first study that we did, we looked at children who ha had known diagnostic for ADHD. We asked them to stop medications for 72 hours. It was done over the weekend so that their parents and fellow students and et cetera would not be too Im impacted by their withdrawal of Ritalin for three days. Um, and you can see here their stride time variability as a function of time over 200 strides at baseline, in other words, off Ritalin, and then when they were given Ritalin uh, below. And you know, again, just visually you can see uh, that stride time variability uh, improved. They were able to walk with a more steady pattern in response to Ritalin. And you can see uh, on a group level, there's a significant reduction in stride time variability in, in these uh, children with ADHD. Not to suggest that they fall, but to suggest perhaps that their, their gait pattern, you know, maybe they have multiple levels of compensation that, that protects them from falling, but do suggest that their gait variability does improve in response to Ritalin. Ritalin, and we also showed that their dual tasking abilities improve, dual tasking gait variability improves in response to Ritalin. So we followed that up with a study in patients with Parkinson's disease, again asking the question, if Ritalin improves attention, uh, can we improve it, and, we, and dual tasking relies on attention, at least in certain patient populations like we showed in Parkinson's disease, can we improve uh, attention abilities and cognitive function with the administration of Ritalin, and will it have a positive impact on their gait? So here's the impact of a single dose of Ritalin on executive function scores. Again, <coughs> better scores are better executive function. You see there's a significant improvement in response to Ritalin in these patients with Parkinson's disease. At the same time, there was a significant reduction in stride time variability. Uh, their gait pattern became more consistent. They were able to walk with a more steady gait pattern. And uh, timed up and go, a measure of full risk uh, also became sig uh, significantly reduced. They were able to complete the time up and go in response to Ritalin in a uh, reduced time, suggesting that perhaps their fall risk is also reduced. Uh, Davos et al. out of France did a similar study, this time looking at chronic doses of Ritalin in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, and they studied off and on medication and, uh, before Ritalin and then after Ritalin, three months after taking high doses of, of Ritalin. And you can see that the, uh, the number of steps were significantly reduced during, during the timed walk, and the time to complete that walk was reduced, and the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale scores were, were reduced or improved, all in response to three, three months of Ritalin. Again, suggesting that not only uh, can attention be improved in response to Ritalin, but gait and 
uh, UPVRS motor signs are improved in response to real in, in patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, we did another study in, in community living older adults. Um, we gave them, this time we, we did it in a double blind placebo controlled fashion, gave them Ritalin or placebo. Here you can see the effects of Ritalin and placebo on memory. Using a, a computerized battery, you can see that the Ritalin had no effect on memory, as one might expect. Uh, Long-term memory is not typically related to attention, but executive function, in this case, as measured by the go-no-go -no -go accuracy, uh, significantly improved in response to Ritalin, no effect uh, in response to the placebo. And similarly, in terms of usual walking, we find the stride time variability of small but significant increases in stride time variability in response uh, to Ritalin, and, and a better effect than that was seen in response to placebo. Also, similar results, uh, not quite as dramatic, but also significant results in terms of their dual, dual tasking, improvements in their stride, stride, stride time variability uh, in response to Ritalin, and as improvement uh, compared to placebo as well. And again, like we saw in patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, significant improvement in time dip and go times uh, in response to Ritalin, better than that seen in response to placebo. Again, suggesting that a, a cognitive enhancing drug is able to improve gait and reduce the risk of falls. It could be that practice, practice, practice might improve our abilities, but if uh, there's no uh, opportunity for learning or motor learning or cognitive improvements, then you might argue that practicing dual tasking from here to tomorrow will have no impact. The first study that looked at this was a study by Celepsidolol, Mary Willicott's group out of Oregon. Um, they looked at uh, uh, 23 older adults. Uh, subjects were divided into three groups, uh, single tasking, those who practiced just walking or the uh, cognitive task while seated, so they didn't practice dual tasking. And then two other groups who practiced dual tasking while walking, and what they called the fixed priority group or the variable, variable priority group, where the focus of attention during the task was either fixed or varied. But uh, in either group, when the subjects who practice this dual tasking during walking, you can see that after the four weeks of the intervention, there was a significant improvement in the dual task gait speed, much larger than that's seen in the subjects who practice only a single task walking. So subjects who practice these, again, older adults who practiced walking while carrying out a dual task were able to improve their ability to walk and perform dual tasking. Again, suggesting the possibility to improve that you know, motor cognitive uh, challenge and reduce the risk of falls. We, we carry out a very similar study in patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, subjects practiced various dual tasks while walking, and they were tested on a different dual task. So we, we didn't, not only did they, we practice a dual task and then see how they did on that specific dual task, but they uh, practiced dual tasking and then were tested on a dual task unrelated to that task. I think it was a, they practiced, for example, serious subtractions, and we, mer we measured their ability to walk while performing verbal fluency tasks, for example. And you can see here, uh, Again, gait speed, usual walking, excuse me, gait speed during dual tasking significantly improved in response to the intervention, and that effect was retained uh, further uh, four to six weeks after they were uh, completed the, uh, um, the intervention, Suge suggesting that there's some retention effects. Not only are subjects able to improve their walking during, in response to the intervention, but that effect is retained you know, as much to one, 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 one and a half months later. We found uh, similar effects on uh, gait variability. Again, gait variability during dual tasking is shown here at baseline. That was reduced uh, in response to the intervention and then reduced further in, uh, after uh, one, month, one, one month later. So again, suggesting not only is training effective, but it, that to some extent at least there's, there's retention and plasticity in the system. Probably the best example of the uh, whether or not practice, practice, practice works is in a study published in Neurology last year uh, by Michael Schwenk and colleagues out of Germany. Uh, they, this is a study done in patients with mild to moderate dementia in a randomized controlled uh, trial. Um, and you can see here at baseline uh, what's called T1. The baseline value is the what's so-called dual task cost in motor performance. This is basically how big 
how, how much is gate affected by the dual task gap baseline. You can see basically gate speed slows down by about 42%. So subjects uh, walked, you know, at one meter per second, for example, at baseline, that's, they're almost cut in half at gate speed at baseline. The impact on cadence and stride length at baseline was also quite dramatic. So stride length was reduced during dual tasking at baseline by about 21%. In contrast, after the intervention, after they practiced um, dual tasking while walking uh, for, uh, I believe it was for a month, uh, you can see the, the impact on gate speed was cut in half from 42% at baseline to 20% at base after the intervention. Similarly, the effect on cadence and stride length were markedly reduced. Again, at stride length, the effect at baseline was 21% and it was down to less than 6% after the inter intervention. And in the control group, basically pre and post, no, no changes. Um, very nice illustration of the impact and the potential, even in older adults with mild to moderate dementia, practicing dual tasking during walking apparently improves their ability to, to carry that out and uh, you might say that it, it re reduces their risk of falls as well. And indeed uh, an article accompanying this, uh, an editorial accompanying this article suggested you know, very clearly that it doesn't provide class 1A evidence but it provides class 2 evidence that specific dual task training improved dual task performing during walking in geriatric patients with mild to moderate dementia. Very uh, interesting and very profound I think study. Another uh, approach to reducing fall risk and uh, improving cognitive function is not practice, 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 not practice dual tasking during walking, but to try to improve cognitive function by various interventions while seated. We know that there's evidence suggesting that uh, playing computer games or games designed to improve cognitive function can have positive impact on Diff different types of, uh, of uh, cognitive function. For example, you see here this, this uh, we talked about primates earlier. Yeah. Here's another example of a primate in front of a computer. And again, you know, there's evidence suggesting that uh, uh, cognitive appropriate uh, mind spas or brain spas can positively impact on cognitive function among older adults. And the question that a number of studies ask whether or not if subjects who participate in such brain spas or mind spas whether that will not only improve their cognitive function, whether or not we'll see a carryover effect to gait and to balance. So here's an example of a Karen Lee at all from uh, out of Canada. Um, where is she? Is she out of? Uh, I'm not sure. On the eastern coast, I believe. Um, she asked uh, again. These are older adults who participated in one of those computer-based training while seated and they measured their, their balance, their postural control pre and post the intervention. And you can see here the sway uh, before and after in the training group and in a con control group. This is the, the magnitude of sway during quiet stance. And there's a significant reduction in reduced sway, which is presumably a, a good thing, uh, in response to the training. So subjects who played computer games uh, designed to improve executive function and attention, their ability to stand without swaying too much was significantly improved compared to control group. I think it's very dramatic uh, evidence on the carryover effect uh, and the relationship between executive function and attention. Another really nice uh, illustration of this idea is from a small study, but again, very nicely illustrates the concept from Joe Vergesi and, and colleagues out of uh, New York. Again, they had older adults who uh, participated in uh, one of these commercial packages uh, interventions, they came to the center three times a week for uh, three months and they played these computer games that were designed to improve executive function and attention and they measured, measured their gait pre and post. And you can see here the percent change in, in gait speed at uh, three months after the, in other words, post the trial. There's a significant about 15% improvement in gait speed and the actual, I didn't bring this slide but uh, this is usual walking gait speed, and if dual tasking gait speed, the percent improvement is about up here. It's about 50%. And in the control group, who did not participate in that, you know, there's basically no effect. Uh, and what's interesting is they found that, that those effects carried out even three months after completion of the intervention. So not only does the intervention produce immediate effects, but there again there appears to be some redemption and some plasticity in the systems that are responsible for, for gait and uh, again for dual tasking gait as well that um, 
in response to this cognitive intervention. So I think it really nicely illustrates and demonstrates how a cognitive intervention, again, this is just playing computer games, uh, improves gait and, and uh, reduces fall risk. We did a similar study, uh, again, in patients with Parkinson's disease, where, again, subjects played computer games for uh, this time, yeah, also for three months. And we measured a number of different parameters. Here you see the, the time dip and go. Uh, there were significant effects, a reduction in the time dip and go, small but significant reduction in the time dip and go afterwards, and uh, uh, seemed to be even further reductions uh, at follow-up, suggesting not only in community living older adults, but in patients with Parkinson's disease, also computerized games uh, have a positive impact on gait. All of these people with Parkinson's disease have normal cognition? No. They have uh, probably mini mentals that are above 24, probably about 28 or so. But if you measure their executive function or attention, it's probably reduced compared to controls. So it depends how you define normal. I think well, normal cognition on cognitive tests. Right. So, so again, Parkinson's disease is normal cognition. Don't have to be the right. Cognition. Right. Right. So these these guys probably they. Um, I'm trying to think. We do have their neuropsych tests. I, th I think that there's, there's cognitive deficits. I'm not sure if it's to the degree of MCI or, or abnormal, so, but... Uh, so what are you improving? If, I mean, if you just have people with Parkinson's disease and no cognitive deficits with the computer training, are you improving the attention or are you improving... Yeah, that's what we're hypothesizing, that we're improving attention and executive function. But so people did have... They had, the, you know, if they're... If the mean for a normal group is 100, so their probably scores are probably around 90 or 95. And, and uh, typically, on those types of scales, we define below 85 as abnormal or as a, you know, one standard, it's kind of a, as on an IQ-like scale. So one standard deviation or 15 points below 85 is considered abnormal, but still in that range between 85 and 100, they have cognitive deficits, but I wouldn't call it abnormal. So it's kind of a, a little bit a matter of definition, but there's, there's room for change. And I think there are also studies suggesting that even in older adults who score, you know, at the mean level, there's, plenty, there's room for change and room for improvement if, and they're in cognitive abilities if given the appropriate stimuli and given appropriate uh, interventions. So, um, and just the final example that I want to end with is a study that we uh, completed a, a year or so ago, again in patients with Parkinson's disease. And this time we're, co we're combining a cognitive intervention with a motor intervention. Um, I, we argued earlier that fall risk is certainly muscle strength and gait, usual walking gait is important in fall risk. But at the same time, most subjects don't uh, fall when they're just walking down an empty uh, hallway. They fall when they're trying to and negotiate obstacles, or within doing m multiple tasks, or within dual tasking. It's the combination of uh, the motor challenge with the cognitive challenge on top of it that often leads to falls. So we asked whether or not we can uh, uh, improve gait in complex environments by augmenting, having subjects with Parkinson's disease train on a treadmill in an environment that's augmented by a virtual reality. Um, we asked whether or not we can improve dual tasking abilities and whether there's attention, retention, and whether that might have a long-term impact on uh, gait and fall risk. So, uh, one second. Uh, here's, uh, actually, okay, here's an example of the patient uh, before training at baseline. You can see there's these virtual obstacles that she sees, and her, she sees her feet in this virtual environment, and she uh, needs to negotiate the obstacles uh, during the training. Notice she's holding onto the railings, that's her, her choice. And basically when she walks, just one more time, um, here comes the obstacle. Basically she almost has stops walking while talking on the treadmill, stops walking while negotiating obstacles on the treadmill. She doesn't know how to plan ahead. She you know, almost stops on the treadmill and in order to walk and try to avoid the obstacles. Here's the same woman uh, six weeks later. Or she's not holding onto the railings anymore. Here comes the obstacle. She walks, she steps over it, she moves forward, she plans ahead, she negotiates the obstacle within it without any problem. Here's another obstacle, takes a small step over it, no problem. Here's one more obstacle. She misses it actually, she runs into the obstacle, but she's able to walk and continue walking without that walking while stopping, 
on the treadmill. Now, does she have a cognitive, what, what is the neurologic condition? Neurologic she has Parkinson's disease. Yeah. But that's fairly fluid movement for Parkinson's. Yeah, it's not, not uh, she probably has a hone in yar about one. It's not, not too, too dramatic uh, per se, but you can, you know, again, normal adults wouldn't be holding onto the railing and, uh, um, yeah, I'll show you some of our baseline scores per group. So we looked at a, a group of these patients uh, before and after the intervention. Um, and here you can see that uh, in response to the six weeks of intervention training with this uh, intervention, a number of performance-based measures of balance and gait improved. For example, the four square test, which is a simple uh, overground test where subjects are asked to walk and step over obstacles. And uh, their times and performance, you see there's a small but significant reduction in their, in their uh, time to complete that task. The dynamic gait index, which is another performance-based measure uh, over ground where higher scores are better. Um, and subjects are asked to walk and perform, move their head, turn, uh, avoid obstacles. And you see there's a significant improvement in response to that. The short physical uh, test, uh, short physical performance test is another test more related to functional activities of daily living. You see again, not really balancing gait performance per se, but again, small but significant improvements. And the six minute walk test is a kind of a test of endurance or functional ebullition. And you can see that the uh, subjects improved by a good uh, almost 70 meters in response to uh, uh, the intervention. What's maybe more interesting is here you see the uh, immediate gain. So these are pre and orange, blue is showing the post effects and then the follow up in gray. Again, these are immediately after the intervention and six, six weeks later. Uh, the usual walking gait speed, gait speed during dual tasking and gait speed during the six minute walk test. And you can see there are the significant improvements in response to the intervention. And those improvements continued to get, become larger uh, when subjects were reassessed a month and a half after the intervention. So there appears to be some maybe behavioral changes, maybe reduced fear of falling, maybe more confidence. Not only did subjects improve, you know, again, keep in mind that these are patients with Parkinson's disease. So if, hypothetically, you would argue that you would like to see gait speed remain here when subjects are, are tested uh, six weeks later and you would hope that they don't return back to baseline values. But we found for all three measures, uh, usual walking gait speed, gait speed during dual tasking, and gait speed during the six minute walk test, these nice and significant continued improvements even after the cessation of the uh, intervention, suggesting again these, that some kind of behavioral or some kind of uh, uh, change in, in daily routine. And I ne neglected to bring it to the show here, we've, we had similar uh, positive impact, we, we measured their gait speed uh, in their ability to negotiate obstacles using the, the gait right, how fast they can move over obstacles placed on the, on the gait mat, and we found similar results, like gait speed improved in response to their negotiation ability to negotiate obstacles over ground, not, on the, not in the virtual environment. Um, this shows the effect of this, what I call motor cognitive intervention, on cognitive function. Here's the trails making uh, TMTA, trails making times, uh, excuse me, trails making test A and B before and after the intervention. And you can see that these uh, small but significant improvement both in TMTB and TMTA uh, in response to this uh, walking in this virtual environment, suggesting that not only does motor function improve, not only does dual tasking improve, but uh, you know, a cognitive test that relies on set shifting uh, and measures executive function improved in response to this <coughs> cognitive motor intervention. It's a very, uh, you know, showing again the two-way interaction between gait and uh, cognitive function and fall risk. And here we, we didn't have a control group in that study, but we did a very, essentially the identical study uh, a few years back. We had <coughs> uh, patients with Parkinson's disease walk, follow the same protocol on the treadmill. They actually uh, participated in uh, a few more sessions in, in the study in virtual environment. They, they practiced three times a week. In our earlier study, they practiced four times a week. Um, but with, in that earlier study, there was no virtual environment. It was just treadmill training in patients with Parkinson's disease of a similar di disease severity. And you can see usual walking, uh, the effects of both treadmill training with uh, 
without virtual reality and with virtual reality. The percent improvement in uh, gait speed and stride length was very similar in those who participated in, in the treadmill training with or without virtual reality. So usual walking uh, gait speed and stride length doesn't matter if I train in a virtual environment or doesn't matter if I just walk on a treadmill uh, for six weeks or, or not. Uh, the key I th is, is really shown here. When, I, when patients with Parkinson's disease walk on a treadmill and just do that, they improve their motor function, but their cognitive function, not surprisingly, is unaffected. So dual tasking gait speed and dual tasking stride length is basically unaffected by uh, treadmill training alone. In contrast, treadmill training with the virtual reality, in other words, treadmill training in those subjects who saw the obstacles and learned how to negotiate and learned how to carry out another task while walking in, the, in this virtual environment, you see this very nice 15% and almost 10% improvement in uh, stride length and 15% of very dramatic improvement in dual tasking gait speed in, in compared to those subjects who only uh, carry out treadmill training alone. So suggesting then in, you know, the added value of virtual reality you know, on top of the treadmill training alone. We did a similar study, uh, a pilot study in community living older adults who had a history of falls and here just just illustrate the number of falls at baseline six months prior to that was appeared to be reduced uh, post training and then appeared to persist more or less six months follow up. We, we're, we're currently starting a large randomized controlled trial, multi-center trial to see if this kind of data actually reduces the number of falls uh, over uh, six months in a large uh, over 300 uh, older adults, so hopefully stay tuned and maybe we'll have some good good results to report back in uh, a little bit. And just, you know, based on those initial results, uh, we also started, uh, and all the evidence about uh, dual tasking and its impact on gait and cognitive function, we, we recently opened a, a clinic in our hospital that uses this concept of uh, treadmill training in virtual reality. Here's our phys a physical therapist and we have number of different setups in the same room using cameras to provide the biofeedback and subjects come in uh, three times a week. Uh, various uh, variety of different subjects who will have this kind of motor and cognitive uh, impairment to try and uh, improve their ability to walk, negotiate obstacles, walk and dual task and uh, reduce the risk of falls. Is so the time is taking any weight or is it just no, a safety? just a safety procedure. Yep. So just to summarize what we've seen in terms of uh, cognitive function and uh, how therapy, cognitive ther therapy impacts on gait, we saw the example from Manuel of Dinepazil increasing uh, uh, usual walking and dual tasking gait speed and uh, no, no effect on uh, in controls. Here this line is uh, what we call the minimum clinically significant difference. This is a change of five uh, centimeters per second has been shown by a number of studies to be the minimally, cl minimal clinically significant uh, difference for, for gait speed and you can see that the nepazil goes way beyond that and uh, no impact in controls. So there's an example of pharmacology improving uh, dual tasking and potentially reducing risk of falls. We saw the study by Solepsidol uh, where they dual task training uh, improved usual walking and dual tasking and no effect in the control group. Again, going way beyond this, this uh, minimal clinically significant difference. Um, and we saw the example by Joe Vergesi and colleagues where cognitive remediation, basically playing computer games, had a significant uh, impact on usual walking and dual tasking gait speed. And again, no effect or minimal effect in controls. And finally, the example that I uh, showed about dual, uh, treadmill training in the virtual reality environment, again showing usual walking and dual task, uh, very significant impacts, much larger than that seen in uh, uh, way above the minimal clinically significant difference. So there are multiple ways that we might think about uh, improving cognitive function and its impact on, on gait and, and fall risk. So just to go back to those questions about Alzheimer's disease, Hopefully by now you're convinced and hopefully you want all the answers to these questions. Why falls are so common in Alzheimer's disease? Uh, why strength training is ineffective in Alzheimer's disease? And uh, why gait changes predict dementia? I would argue it's just one answer for all of the above and that is because 
gate relies on executive function. Executive function is also impaired in Alzheimer's disease. It's not only memory, but executive function is well known to be impaired in Alzheimer's disease. And the multifactorial, traditional multifactorial interventions that are commonly used in geriatric uh, clinics doesn't work on executive function. If we don't work on it, uh, we're not going to reduce the risk of falls in patients like this. Uh, certainly it's useful among subjects who have uh, weakness, but if they have weakness and executive impairment, we need to focus on that as well. And uh, so we've, you know, I think there's ample evidence to show that cognitive de deficits likely exacerbate fall risk. And there's a growing evidence that enhancing cognitive function, in particular executive function via drugs, uh, apparently can enhance gait and reduce the risk of falls. And there are other ways that might also be uh, efficacious, whether it's training or motor learning, might also in impact on gait and dual tasking. But yes, I do want to caution that the studies that have looked on cognitive interventions for gait and, and fall risk are smaller number. There's obviously publication bias <coughs> and large prospective studies are needed to determine the potential of uh, various cognitive uh, therapies would be the pharmacologic, like uh, cholinesterase inhibitors or methylphenidate, or other pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic approaches to improving gait and fall risk via cognitive therapy. I would like to thank you for your attention, acknowledge the funding agencies that have supported some of our work, and my colleagues who are shown here improving their gait speed, uh, at least uh, momentarily. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> basically just have some housekeeping thing before going to the question and answer. Remember uh, Jennifer White talk, she, she's not here today, but she was very important in the organization of this seminar. And Jennifer was uh, super helping us to arrange all the details for the seminar. So Jennifer, she's in Ohio, thank you very much. And also to the funding company, in particular the Gate Right System Incorporated uh, help us for some funds, also Pfizer Pharmaceutical Company and the Campbell Foundation in London also give some money to bring Dr. Haldor here. So thank you to those sponsors and now we are open to your questions. Any questions? Michael? Uh, did you actually show us the evidence that uh, exercise doesn't help Alzheimer's uh, improve an Alzheimer's disease, other than saying it didn't. But, um, there was, I mean, there's one study that took the uh, standard multi, you know, geriatric uh, intervention, multifactorial geriatric intervention study in the British Medical Journal, I think in 2003 by Shaw and all, and they applied the standard multifactorial intervention of, of uh, gait training, balance training, strength training, and found no significant improvements in, in uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease. That's, Okay, so these were people with Alzheimer's disease who had a tendency to fall, or who had... Um, I'm not, yes, 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 correct. And, and so the usual approach to falls reduction in that group didn't... Correct. Some sort of individualized approach. Right. And that included strength training? Yes. Okay. Richard? I'm sure it's simplistic to say that message I get is if you're going to do a complex function, when you concentrate on it, you'll do better, and if you're distracted, you'll do worse, and if you practice, it will improve. Um, and I just wonder if gait is just one of those sufficiently complex things that it actually shows these effects. Has nobody actually tried to produce an upper limb test of similar complexity to see if this, these sort of relationships hold for all such functions? Um, and you did the tapping thing, but that hardly sort of sure. tests the system, does it? Correct. I, first of all, I, yes, I agree with you that that is, you know, th the way you characterized uh, gait as a complex function and uh, that is sub sensitive to distraction and uh, sensitive to attention is, is probably a good way to view things. Um, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything magic per se about gait. And, you're right, I think other complex motor tasks might be, you know, upper extremity tasks are likely to be as sensitive to dual tasking. The, the key difference b between those and gait is that, you know, uh, typically, you know, usually we don't fall when we're writing, you know. So that's, but in terms of uh, sensitivity and attention resources, I agree that they're likely to be equally as sensitive. 
just the difference is that uh, we do gait while we're upright and prone, you know, predisposed to fall risk and uh, do some of those other tasks while we're seated or doing other tasks. But I think in terms of the understanding um, the pathology and, you know, what's going on under, uh, underlying the mechanisms, I think you're 100% correct that there's, uh, there are likely to be other tasks that uh, show equal sensitivity to dual tasking and, and attention effects. Do you think you could come up with a computer system that you could make as difficult and as complex, but yet a lot easier to do than marching people around on uh, treadmills? Uh, yeah, sure. Can predict falls just as well? I think you're probably right. Yeah. I One of the things that physios often do with patients with Alzheimer's is give them a walker or a cane as they're having problems with walking. Is that, in essence, giving them a dual task and making them more likely to fall? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Yes and no, I think is a, I think there was a, there was a study by Brian Mackey and colleagues who also, my, Brian is out of where? Uh, Toronto. Toronto, uh, a few years ago in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and he basically says that uh, many of those walking aids are not effective at reducing falls. Um, he showed, I th if I remember correctly, that fall risk with or without the walking aids in a number of different populations was, was the same. Um, and I think part of the reason is perhaps that, well, there, there could be multiple things going on, but part of it is that they may need to be focusing their attention on the walker rather than everything else that's going on. Um, there was a, just a study, I can't remember if I either reviewed it or read it, so I'm not sure what it was, but actually exactly addressed your question in uh, not in Alzheimer's disease, but in older adults, where they studied the effects of dual tasking on subjects who, with or without a walker, and they claimed that it was it didn't have that effect. So, I think uh, it's an excellent question. I think the jury's still out, but I think it's important to think about. I know, for example, in um, and the trade-offs when we give people external cues and and aids. You know, for example, in in patients with Parkinson's disease, one of the things that we do in therapy is give them uh, auditory cues. We ask them to, to count or to, you know, one, two, three, or, uh, or so-called rhythmic auditory stimulation to try and prove their, the pacing of their gait. And again, the question there is, are we asking them to dual task? Are they, is that distracting them from their gait? And so it, there are, I think there are trade-offs involved. And we also need to think about whether or not we're focusing, if we're focusing their attention on gait. So maybe, you know, the dual task is actually restoring gait and improving gait at, at with only minimal additional attention abilities but, and distractions. But I, th I think it's an excellent question and I think minimally we should be wary of it when we prescribe various aids and what it, we're trying to, to get out. Get out. Well, one of the things we, we try to convey with those kind of seminars and if we can develop a false fracture claim, is cognitive evaluation, particular executive function, should be part of the fall assessment. And we just got accepted by Jack's a systematic review that Susan Moore is the first author in where we demonstrate in the literature that executive function is a key factor for risk of falls, independent of cognition. People that they are qualified, normal cognitive people with executive function, they have more falls and fractures. And particularly, that is, you know, challenging about the concept which is normal, which is abnormal, right? Normal condition, tw uh, 29 in the minimenta, but the executive dysfunction, we know, have more force and fracture. So that should be part of the assessment. So I think the future, when we want to prescribe those devices, part of the evaluation should be not only, you know, muscle and the muscular evaluation, but also executive function attention. And we have to select which test of the executive function for that. I think it's a very interesting area for research, but there will be clear, clear, clear clinical translation. Clear clinical translation very fast. A question from Joel Cruz and after Alex. Joel. In, in the studies you've described about uh, dual tasking, you've talked about the effects of talking and walking at the same time. What about other activities like just listening and walking, um, like individuals who, and that sort of, does that maybe reflect concentration or some people who have sufficient concentration that they can get on with even creative work by blocking out noise? And other people, including myself, who are trying to, when I'm trying to be uh, creative or think I need to sort of block, I need to block out the noise. 
I'm just wondering whether you looked at Sure, it's a good question. Noise or outside um, sound and <coughs> Well, I think the, you know, the first partial answer to your question is that we're not all created equal. And that for, you know, what might be a difficult task for you, it might be a very easy task for someone else and vice versa. So someone who, you know, we had a, one of the first anecdotal tests that we did in uh, Walking by Talking, we asked one of our research assistants, is one of these math gurus, to walk across the hotel lobby and while subtracting serial sevens, and he didn't blink, and he, you know, had absolutely no effect on his gait. Now he, has, you know, on the other hand, if you ask some people to subtract serial sevens, they kind of get phobic and they have, you know, fear of numbers, and so, uh, the specific task definitely has, you know, might have an impact to, to specific individuals. You know, you might have someone who's very skilled at languages and verbal fluency. They can come in with, a, you know, a, a zillion letters that start with with a V. Another person who is uh, less skilled in languages and might not be quite as good at that. So that's one part of the answer. The other thing is we have looked at, you know, different tasks. We've looked at serial subtractions. We've looked at motor tasks, people look at ask, ask people to walk and carry trays, for example. And we've looked at uh, what we call simple listening, which we thought might be more reflective of walking while li carrying out a conversation or listening to someone else. So we had people listen to a story on tape, and then they were asked, you know, knew, knowing that they would be asked about its content later on. And we found that that also did have an impact on their gait, but it was much more subtle uh, than some of the other tests that we looked at. We all, you know, you can play with that a lot. Of, you can kind of crank up the level of difficulty in the in the psychological literature. There's something called phony monitoring. It's uh, where they listen to something and they're asked to count the phonemes. How many times they hear the sound ma or pa or whatever during a, a story. So you can uh, you can play with that and you kind of can tune it to uh, adjust the, the cognitive load. By, you know, if you ask them to, to listen to one phoneme or to multiple phonemes and the frequency content of the phonemes, you can adjust all of those things and see how that affects the you know, impacts on gait by adjusting your cognitive load. And we found list, simple listening ha does have an effect by itself, but uh, as you add more and more complexity onto that, it becomes more difficult and has a bigger impact. Alex, is it? You have shown that gait does have fractal properties. Does cognition or falling have fractal properties? Uh, don't. Um, is it time for coffee? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not. I'm Maybe not really sure. Uh, similar processes or structures that repeat in cyclic way. Yeah, so normal walking, correct. Normal walking gait pattern has this, these uh, self-similar properties where if you look over different time scales, if you look over just a few strides or 10 strides or 100 strides or 1,000 times, the, the properties are statistically related. And that seems to change both with aging and neurodegenerative disease. And in fallers as well, that seems to decline. Um, I'm not... Calypsis would argue that falling is a fractal, so I just thought that you might have an Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the falling per se and how that fits in, but I certainly would agree with uh, Dr. Lipsitz that uh, there's a you know, reduction in complexity and in fractal properties that are uh, exacerbated in fullers mm -hmm. compared to non fullers I think that's a very interesting question. It's a, it's a topic for a full seminar. <laughs> Yes, no. I have a question about assessing the task in gait. <coughs> so when you uh, give someone a task, uh, a baseline the measurement layer, do you take into account the, the success that they had while doing the dual task? So if their velocity doesn't change, but they're able to answer like, five more questions the next time you do it, does that mean they yeah. do their dual task in gait? It's a, sure, that's a good question. We always, uh, as we learn more about dual tasking, initially we just gave them dual task and watch their effect on gait, but uh, now uh, anytime we, we carry out a dual tasking study, we have them perform the cognitive task in the seated position as well. So we look at the impact of, the overall impact of the combined task on both on, on gait and cognitive function. So for example, 
even young adults, uh, well, first of all, it's important to find out even healthy young adults slow down when they uh, ask to walk and dual task. You know, those nice examples of the patient of, of you know subjects walking on the phone and doing all sorts of things. That's correct. You don't see them falling. Most people don't fall when they walk and dual task, but. Um, even healthy young adults do slow down when they walk in, in dual task, at least uh, if the cognitive challenge is sufficiently large. And even healthy young adults, if the cognitive challenge is sufficiently large, like subtracting serial sevens, which is not a super difficult task, but it's not trivial, the number of errors in that task will increase during walking, even in healthy young adults. So there's clearly you know, some trade-offs and uh, there's a question of the focus of, of, of attention and what the instructions are. Again, and, and you can ask, um, if, depending on your instruction set and what you ask the patients or the subjects to do, you can ask them to focus more attention on your gait at the expense of the cognitive task or vice versa. And you can see kind of a plasticity in the, in the ability to adjust our focus of attention. If you ask them to uh, try and walk during, you know, do the dual task by walk, by maintaining performance as if they you know as if they're doing a single task you'll see that that uh, cognitive uh, impacts on the cognitive function cognitive function is redu reduced while gain, gain improves and vice versa the interesting thing is that uh, in healthy adults actually we kind of in some sense prioritize we have enough cognitive and motor reserves so that uh, you can say that our default position is that we prioritize cognitive function over gait during walking um, you know, if we compare the focus of attention afterwards, if we change it, our, the default position is more like if we ask the subject to focus on attention. Mm. A little bit count. When, you are, when um, you are currently intact, you are posture first. You, you put more priority in your posture. Um, only if posture becomes challenged. Yes. If it so challenged, yeah, sure. if you're able to walk and uh, continue to walk without challenging your gait too much, you actually uh, do that at, at the expense of your, your gait. You slow down a little bit, yes. and you devote more attention to your cognitive function, which is a little counterintuitive. Yes. One question. All those studies were on fairly limited, or minimal impact of patients, right? Their Alzheimer's wasn't as progressed, the cognitive wasn't as progressed. Would the same dual task training work in patients who have more mobility impairment, perhaps more obvious mobility impairment due to the cognitive change of dementia? Um, good question. Um, I think we don't really, there's not strong evidence to that, but I think um, I think it's hard to argue. I mean, in the, the, the study by Schwenk, where they do the dual task training in dementia, was mild to moderate dementia. So I don't know where exactly you, you think is, you know, the cutoff. the cutoff. Right, but, but, towards right. The training but I, I think, uh, you know, certainly when we thought about, about you know, a priori again, what, what do we advise patients? We could, you could say to patients, well, focus only on your gait, don't dual task. And, you know, when you're walking, just walk and ignore everything else. And uh, maybe that is the message at some point but uh, clearly, at least, you know, in terms of advice to the patient, on the other hand, we might want to intervene and try and improve their function and their ability to, it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to tell your patients to walk and only focus on your gait. It's one thing, and another thing in practice, in everyday life, there's lots of dual task situations. So maybe the idea is to give them the ability to, uh, you know, train them maximally to walk and to navigate in complex environments that require dual and multitasking while at the same time advising them to try and focus their attention so that uh, you know, they don't really have to rely on those uh, attentional abilities most of the time. One question? Well, we have a, a small gift as an appreciation for your visit. Here it is uh, for you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much.